In this video, we're going to talk about the immune system. The immune system is just a system that helps us defend our body. And the reason why we need to be defended in terms of our body is because there are actually lots of microbes and pathogens in our, in our body and on our body. For example, on our skin, they will be in the air as well, so they can get into our body through the air or through the nose. They can get into our body from water that we drink. Right? There's pathogens all over the place. These could be, for example, the plasmodium protozoa. They could be the flu virus. It could be a bacteria that causes food poisoning. It could be a virus that causes the cold or a bacteria that causes the tetanus. Just to name very few, but there's obviously way more, right? But the idea is we need to protect our body. And there's two systems that do this. There's the non-specific, also known as innate, and the specific, also known as acquired. So the non-specific is just that basically it targets anything that enters our body. So for example, all these different pathogens I mentioned earlier, the non-specific one targets any of them, right? Whereas the specific one just targets every time a specific pathogen comes in, we will have one type of response for each individual one, right? So it's specific towards the actual pathogen, whereas non specific just targets anything that's a pathogen, anything that's not meant to be there will be targeted. And it consists of first and second line of defense, which are the ones we cover in this video, whereas the third line of defense we'll cover in a different video, right? But so I'll talk about the second line, the first line of defense now. And this is the non specific, right? So it means it doesn't discriminate. Anything that's not meant to be there will be removed. And we've got the skin, which would be a really good example of non-specific first line defense. Basically, it's the first barrier to entry into our body. And the skin obviously covers most of our body. And the skin consists of a couple different things. First of all, it's a thick layer in terms of the actual skin, which is good because the actual pathogens need to go through a long way to get to our blood vessels because of that thickness. Most of them can't get there because of it being so thick. Also, it's really dry as well. And that means that a lot of the microbes can't grow because it's quite dry. Dryness is not good for growth. It also has oil glands. These oil glands, what they do is they produce some antimicrobial chemicals, which will kill off um, bad bacteria or pathogens. And also really important, we've got these lots of these good bacteria, which we call our microflora. So it's just a layer of good bacteria. And these will inhabit our layer of skin, top layer of skin. And what they do is they take away space from the actual bad bacteria. And they will also lower the pH which will uh, kill back bacteria that try to uh, basically colonize the skin. Uh, so all these would be examples of ways to make sure that these bad bacteria can't infect the top of our skin and more importantly can't get into our body or into our blood where they would cause ma massive problems. Another example would be our mucous membrane. We said we've got skin but the problem is there always have to be some openings. So for example, the mouth, the nose, the genitalia, the anus, all these would be openings that have to be there to make sure stuff can come in and out of our body, but they need to be protected as well. And this is where we have the mucous membrane. What the mucous membrane is, is just lots of cells, you know, lots of cells that consist of um, cells that produce mucus, and then we have this mucus which traps that, that actual pathogen, right? So we've got these purple ones, which are meant to be the ones that produce the mucus, and you can see this blue stuff, that's the mucus that gets produced. It's just a layer of mucus. So you can see these pathogens might come in and then they will get stuck on the mucus. They can't actually anchor and they get stuck and just get washed away more or less, right? And these mucus membranes are really good just first line defense to make sure pathogens can't invade that area of the body. And they're, they're found usually on, the, on all the openings, so mouth, anus, um, genitalia, etc. And then one special type of mucus membrane is a mucus membrane that has all the ones that the first one had, but it also has a small little hair called the cilia. And these cilia, what they do is, when we have a pathogen that gets trapped, we have lots of these pathogens that get tra trapped in the actual mucus. What these cilia do is they will actually move all those pathogens up towards our throat. Because where we can find this mucous membrane with the cilia is in the, at our trachea, which is our throat. So we're going to have it all being pushed up, and then afterwards we're going to have it coughed out. Right? So cilia just help us cough out the actual pathogens, and you can find that in a trachea. But we also have the other chemical barriers. All these would be not examples of first line defense. For example, tears, they have antimicrobial properties to make sure they can kill off any bacteria on our eye. Stomach acid, this lowers the pH, which means all of the, many of the um, actual bacteria will be denatured, or many pathogens will just die from that low pH. So is our urine. Urine has low pH, so when we urinate, we kill, on, kill off any pathogens at our genitalia. And saliva, saliva and antimicrobial properties. So all these would be examples of chemicals that we just produce to try to make sure that they can't get into our body, especially into our actual blood. And then one example of a disease that actually is caused on the outside of our body, 
because remember when we talk about outside here, we're not actually talking about our our outside, purely our skin, or even for example our intestinal tract, which should obviously would be inside our body. That's still outside in case of our definition. Inside is just blood. Anything else outside. But one example of what is actually caused outside our body would be a thrush, also known as candiasis. That's caused by a fungal or a um, actual yeast called C. albicans. You can see this is the fungal infection. This is thrush here. And it can affect our mouth. It can affect our genitalia tract, for example, the vaginal tract. And it can even affect our intestines, for example, our large intestine. Because how it works is usually our large intestine would have plenty of this good microflora of good bacteria, right? So a microflora is just lots of good bacteria and or good good microbes that inhabit our area that cause no problems because they just help us. And in this case, this is our large intestine and usually we have lots of them. And they take away the space from the bad microbes, in this case the pathogens. So this fungi, this C. albicans wants to be able to kind of adhere, anchor, but it can't because there's no space for it. But if we overuse, for example, antibiotics, what antibiotics do is they kill off bacteria. They can also kill off bad, good bacteria. So if we overuse antibiotics, we can sometimes, by mistake, kill off all the good bacteria, which gives more space to this actual um, bad thrush-causing pathogen called the C. albicans. And what that means is they have more space, and then they will anchor onto our outside of us, our, in this case, um, large intestine, and they will cause thrush, the infection thrush. Right. So it is here. It's just a, lots of these fungi, lots of these yeast that have grown there because something went wrong. Right. So for example, the overuse of antibiotics would be one example. But it could also be that we don't produce enough stomach acids, which means they can actually get to a large intestine because they don't get killed before they get there. Or maybe general illness as well. Right? These be some examples so that could that can cause um, thrush because our body isn't working as it should. But then we also have to have some defense to make sure that things inside our body are protected. And what I mean by inside our body is, again, blood or the tissue between our actual, sorry, the, the, the fluid between our actual tissue, right? so all of our cells. These are what I mean by inside our body. And what we have here is we have something called antigens. What antigens are is it's just any molecule that identifies a cell or a pathogen or any other part, any other particle as foreign. Right? So you can see here, this, for example, might be a virus. This might be a bacteria. This is a transplanted cell. All of these have something sticking out, which is just, it can be any molecule, different types of molecules. But what these molecules have in common is they can recognize, they, rec they help the white blood cells recognize that they're not coming from self. They're not coming from their own body. Whereas if this might be a platelet, so this might be normally in our actual blood, and this will have molecules that will recognize it as coming from self as opposed to from somewhere else. So what these antigens are, it's just a way for these white blood cells to be able to recognize what it's meant to be killing or what it's meant to be targeting, right? So if it has an antigen, it will be destroying those. Right? And if it doesn't, it will keep it keep it alive and keep it just protected, right? And the problem is, well, the good part is, you know, all these antigens are found on viruses and bacteria and other actual pathogens, which is good. But they can even be found, for example, on transplanted tissue. So if you get an organ transplant, one of the problems we often have is because it's coming from somewhere else, it's not self, it will have antigens as well on it, even though they're not causing any harm. They still have antigens because it's coming from somewhere else. And that means your actual white blood cells will attack those transplanted tissue, and they will cause massive problems. Right? That's just the idea of antigens. That's basically how our immune system inside our body works. It can identify anything that has an antigen, and thereby destroy it. And that could even include, for example, toxins produced by bacteria, or venom produced by snakes. These Even these have antigens which are targeted by our um, defense system. But why is that important? Because all of this plays into role when it comes to second line defense. Second line defense is again non-specific, so it's basically where the white blood cells will target anything that it finds that has an antigen. Right? So in this case this might be a macrophage, which is an example of white blood cell, and if it finds a bacteria or if it finds a virus or it finds anything else that has these antigens, it will target for destruction. So that's how second line defense works. It works with the antigens, which basically identify anything as foreign. And there's four parts to it, and we have to quickly cover each. There's the inflammation response, phagocytosis, the lymphatic system, and cell death to seal off pathogens. Now, why else is this all important? Because we do have pathogens inside our blood, or we would have pathogens inside our tissue, so our fluid between our 
tissues, right? and we need to keep both of those protected. And these different ones I mentioned earlier are just there to keep us protected. So for example, the inflammation response, what it does, it makes these blood vessels dilate, and blood vessels dilating is generally quite useful because that means we've got more white blood cells that can get towards tissue. So blood vessels dilating just means that it becomes larger, there's more space because they have, they've dilated, right? And then what happens next is you literally have more space for white blood cells. So you'd have more white blood cells in that same amount of space. That means more fighting infection because white blood cells fight infection, right? So that's basically what um, blood vessels dilate do. And why is this actually, why does this, how does the inflammation start? Well, for example, if there's an infected cell, such as this one here, this one is infected by viruses, these infected cells will produce chemicals, and these chemicals will basically trigger the inflammation response. So these infected cell knows it's in trouble, it will produce these chemicals, and these chemicals will start off the inflammation response. One of them was then to actually dilate the blood vessels, and also to make these blood vessels more leaky as well, so it makes them more permeable, which means there's, there's basically small holes in the actual blood vessels, because you can imagine those white blood cells are quite thick, they're quite big, and need to squeeze through from the blood to get into the actual tissue that might be affected. So that's why these, when the inflammation response is affected, when it's trying to help these cells that are being attacked, it needs to make the blood vessels more leaky, and that's why they become these little more, more holes basically in the blood vessels. Also the temperature increases. Why does the temperature increase? Well, remember there's enzymes in, for example, bacteria, and if the temperature increases, these bacteria enzymes might get denatured, which won't kill them, but it will slow them down. So it will slow down reproduction, which means the actual white blood cells have more time to fight that infection as well. Another thing that happens is that just swelling in that area increases as well, right? And that's obviously fair enough. For example, if you've got uh, lots of these different things now in the white blood cells in that area, and there's more fluid that goes in that area as well because of the leaky white blood cells, uh, white, leaky blood vessels, that means the whole area will swell up. So these are some of the things that happen when you have the inflammation response, and it just helps us to kill off any pathogens that have entered our blood or our fluid between our tissues. We also have phagocytosis, and phagocytosis is just a process that white blood cells, especially macrophages and other phagocytes, the process they use to actually kill um, pathogens, right? So for example, if we have this white blood cell finding this actual bacteria, what will happen is first it will lock on, so it will find these antigens where it can lock on. Once it's locked on, it will basically engulf it. That's why it's called phago. Phago means engulf, so it will engulf it, which means it will basically eat it. Once it's eaten it, what it will do is produce chemicals. So lysosomes within it will produce chemicals, enzymes, and these enzymes will digest it, so it will destroy the actual pathogen, it will digest it, and then more or less just spit it out again afterwards. So that's the process of phagocytosis. And when it comes to the lymphatic system, why the lymphatic system is important. Lymphatic system consists of lymph vessels and lymph nodes, and you can imagine there's lots of fluid between our cells, and this fluid, first of all, gets quite dirty sometimes because there's so many different tissues that are functioning on a daily basis, and also there might be viruses in that actual tissue as well. So we have to have a way to recycle and clean that tissue on a daily basis, on a frequent basis, to make sure that these tissue cells are healthy because the fluid is being replaced. So what happens is we actually have these lymph vessels, and all of the actual fluid from our our tissue here will flow through these lymph vessels at some stage, and that means that the debris or dirt will be removed, but also because in that lymph vessels will also travel actual um, viruses or pathogens. When they get to something called lymph nodes, at the lymph nodes we've got lots of white blood cells guarding the lymph nodes, so it's more like a police station, and when, when they get towards there, these viruses will basically be attacked by these white blood cells, and they will then be destroyed, and then they, they, that will be removed, so the debris will be removed as well. So more or less what the lymphatic system does in, in the actual immune si response, or the immune system, second line defense, it's just, it's a place where anything that travels past it, any pathogen travels past it, will get destroyed. And then we also have the cell death to, to seal off any problem area, so usually, I mean, most of the time we have everything under control in terms of our white blood cells, they will eventually destroy invasion, but sometimes we might have some blood cells, some white blood cells that have to actually basically surround an infected area and then kill themselves. The reason why they do that is because then they can trap their pathogens. So for example, these virus infected cells will be trapped, which means they don't get any nutrients, they can't survive, they will die. And when they die, the virus dies with it. And the reason why this happened is because it, yeah, they couldn't get any access to anything. Um, and these viruses can't spread. 
So cell program cell is just worst case scenario, and they'll do this to make sure that the pathogen doesn't spread any further if they lost control more or less. But these were just some of the examples of the non-specific immune response. And hopefully this will give you some insight in terms of the videos that will come up next, because this is just the introduction to this chapter. But yeah, hopefully that was useful.